Hello friends, the topic for today's discussion will be asthma and bronchiectasis and before we go towards these topics, I think we should uh, revise a little bit about the previous uh, topics in which we discussed emphysema and uh, chronic bronchitis and uh, if you if you remember emphysema as we have discussed is basically a morphological disorder it is basically a disorder in which there is some kind of um, destruction of the smaller airways right so the small alveoli at the, at the level of respiratory bronchioles are involved cigarette smoke smoking plays an important role in the causation of, uh, of emphysema the, the pathogenesis it, it it is mainly an imbalance between the protease and anti-protease levels right so if there's deficiency of anti-protease or there is more uh, amount of protease as we know that it can be elastase in this case there will be destruction of the alveolar walls and it may be associated with chronic bronchitis chronic bronchitis as such is a disorder which is diagnosed clinically in which you have purulent sputum for uh, at least three months for two consecutive years so this is how you basically diagnose chronic bronchitis the the main feature which is again cigarette smoking is going to be uh, quite important in causation of chronic bronchitis and this cigarette smoke basically leads to submucosal gland hypertrophy the, the, the glands presence in the submucosa are hypertrophied and this this is because of the, the smoke of the cigarette but it mainly involves the large airways initially and then it may involve the small airways as well right so we, we know we know about about that and we obviously we also discuss about uh, read index which is and uh, which is actually a ratio of the submucosal gland layer to the wall of the bronchus or of the airway so this normally is around 0.4 but in cases of chronic bronchitis, this read index is slightly high because of smooth other because of the submucosal gland hypertrophy. So today's topic, which we are going to discuss, is going to be asthma. Now, now some um, some important features about asthma. It is quite similar to chronic bronchitis. It is also going to involve the larger airways, and it is also going to be a chronic inflammatory disorder of the of the airways but there are certain hallmarks there are certain things which are present in asthma and uh, quite absent in cases of chronic bronchitis until unless the chronic bronchitis has an asthmatic component which is called as the chronic asthmatic bronchitis right so so in this case there will be recurrent episodes of wheezing there will be breathlessness the patient may complain of chest of of chest tightness and cough which is more at night or early in the morning so, so so there are some triggers which basically lead to uh, bronchospasms there are certain things which may lead to uh, increased activity of the bronchus which may lead to intermittent and reversible airway obstruction now the word the, the in, there's an important word called as reversible as we know that asthma is uh, is a reversible obstructive pulmonary disease as compared to the other three which are completely irreversible it's not that the patient will be completely healed of asthma and the patient will not have asthma i mean this a bout of asthma is reversible there will be chronic bronchial inflammation which is very important again there will be chronic bronchial inflammation now depending upon the type of asthma this inflammation can be non-specific that means there will be more of neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages and so on or it can have a lot of eosinophils if it is mainly an allergic uh, asthma, it is having some allergic etiology. The bronchial smooth muscles undergo hypertrophy, they undergo hyperplasia, they undergo hyperreactivity and we will see how they undergo this hyperreactivity. So the main hallmark or one of the hallmarks is bronchial smooth muscle hypertrophy and hyperplasia and just to, to revise 
your uh, foundation block we, we talked about uh, compensatory mechanisms in which certain things they undergo hyperplasia whereas other things they cannot undergo hyperplasia and one of those things uh, 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 of those things are muscles mainly the skeletal muscles and uh, the cardiac muscle both these muscles cannot undergo hyperplasia but in interestingly the smooth muscles the smooth muscles they can undergo hypertrophy as well as hyperplasia the fourth hallmark is uh, there will be increased mucus secretion and this mucus is going to play a pivotal role because it is going to cause a lot of obstruction so so all these things basically there is inflammation which is going to cause inflammation there is smooth muscle hyperactivity hypertrophy hyperplasia which is going to cause obstruction and accumulation of mucus within the airways is going to cause obstruction a lot of cells they play a uh, role in causation of asthma you have eosinophils if it is a kind of allergic asthma mast cells macrophages lymphocytes neutrophils epithelial cells so all these cells basically play an important role in uh, causing asthma we, we also have to understand that in cases of um, on of, of of asthma if we have to compare it with chronic bronchitis it can be seen in young uh, children in, in at a young age as compared to chronic bronchitis which is mainly seen in uh, adults it can be divided into two types it can be atopic asthma or it can be non uh, atopic asthma uh, this atopic asthma is the one which has a genetic predisposition there is atopic and there is a non atopic asthma in both the cases in both the cases it doesn't really matter what starts the activity the final the, the final outcome the final pathogenesis is going to be the same that is bronchial uh, obstruction inflammation hypertrophy hyperplasia and production of increased mucus so this atopic asthma in 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 these patients they have a genetic predisposition towards uh, uh, towards asthma and that means they they are always allergic to certain things and there is type 1 hypersensitivity hypersensitivity reaction which is going to play an important role in causation of atopic asthma as compared to the non atopic asthmas so as we have discussed these patients can be predisposed to type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that means they may have a, a genetic uh, they may have something which runs in their family right so the, this is called as atopy or atopic asthma there will be acute and chronic airway inflammation a lot of infections a lot of especially the viral infections they may lead to acute and chronic airway inflammations and these inflammations may trigger the attack of asthma there will be bronchial hyper responsiveness to a variety of uh, stimuli and these stimuli can be inhaled air pollutants like sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide they are quite common triggers which may lead to bronchial hyper responsiveness in cases of atopic or extrinsic asthma that means those types of asthma in which there is a family history of atopy or there is a family history of asthma and and of course these type of asthma will be uh, seen in children in quite an early childhood because it is a genetically predisposed condition so it is mainly uh, ige mediated has a genetic predisposition and the second one is non atopic it is also called as intrinsic asthma now these two uh, classifications they don't really play an important role because anyways the final outcome is going to be the same the pathogenesis is going to be quite similar as far as so only these etiologies do vary but the final outcome the final pathogenesis is quite similar in both these conditions so non immune stimuli such as drugs such as aspirin which is called as a drug induced asthma pulmonary infections most commonly viral viral infections they play a very important role in causation of asthma Uh, cold air exercise inhaled irritants pollutants they can only lead to um, uh, intrinsic asthma or non atopic asthma now if we look here very carefully we have to understand the concept of uh, type type 1 hypersensitivity reaction 
Now what happens is initially you are not sensitized to the to this allergen which, which can be an antigen which is an allergen. So there's an antigen presenting cells on, on the surface of the epithelia which will give it to a Th2 type of helper T cells. These 2H Th2 type of helper T cells they are the ones which play a very important role. Th2 type of helper T cells play a very these are the, the cells which are mainly involved. So, so this antigen which is processed is now being gifted to uh, Th2 type of helper T cells. Now this Th2 type of helper T cells are going to produce certain cytokines. They will be producing interleukin 4, they will be producing interleukin 5, interleukin 13 and, e and, and, and all these interleukins they are going to, uh, to have some, some role or the other. The role of interleukin 4 is to produce IgE. It actually helps the B cell to produce IgE. So, so this B cell is going to, pr be, to produce Im immunoglobulin E and this immunoglobulin E is going to mask the surface of the mast cell. Now this mast cell does not know about this antigen yet. So it actually is now getting sensitized. But at this stage it won't do anything. It will just simply tolerate this and they will have the FC receptor for the immunoglobulin E and immunoglobulin E's they will come there and they will nicely cover the surface of the mast cells. It also produces interleukin-5. The function of interleukin-5 is to uh, recruit eosinophils. So this is going to call a lot of eosinophils. Also eotexin which is produced by the epithelial cell are going to produce a lot of eosinophils and they will get activated and they will release all these granules and mediators which are present within the cytoplasm of an eosinophil. Now, Upon second exposure, we already have these immunoglobulins which are against this antigen. Remember, this all these immunoglobulins are against this antigen. So these antibodies are against this antigen. So when you have a second exposure of this antigen, the, and the, the antibodies are already present over the surface of the mast cell and this is going to degranulate the mast cells and mast cells are going to secrete a lot of mediators which can be primary mediators or secondary mediators depending upon that you have something called as an immediate phase or a, the, or a late phase. The first phase or, or immediate phase is going to make these submucosal or subepithelial efferent the vigor receptors they get hyper reactive and when they get hyper reactive they are going to cause all the effects of asthma especially in the form of smooth muscle hyperreactivity, smooth muscle hyperplasia. So it is going to activate the smooth muscle and this will lead to bronchoconstriction and finally you have a constricted airway. In the sec second phase or in the late phase it is going to cause a lot of inflammation and this inflammation is going to produce a lot of mucus, it is going to cause damage to the wall, there will be recruitment of neutrophils, basophils will come there, eosinophils will come there and all these things will cause damage to the wall and will further accentuate this obstruction by production of mucus inflammation in the wall of the bronchus. This is how we can also remember it again this macrophage which is an antigen presenting cell and this is processing the antigen this antigen is being presented to a Th2 type of helper T cells which is going to produce IL4, IL5, interleukin 13 and is going to uh, produce immunoglobulin E and these immunoglobulin E are going to mask the surface of a mast cell. They will be covering the surface of the mast cell but this is the first phase of so the mast cell will just simply tolerate. In the second phase when they come in contact with the same antigen again they degranulate and they will have all the features of type 1 hypersensitive reaction and in, in the second phase they will cause chronic inflammation. So all these leukotrienes will be produced, acetylcholine will be produced, histamine, prostaglandin D2, critical activating factor and a lot of eosinophils products will be produced in the, especially in the second phase because the first phase is mainly, uh, uh, is mainly only which, which leads to bronchoconstriction. So you have again bronchoconstriction here which leads to increased vascular permeability, increased mucin secretion, acetylcholine will cause it it will cause smooth muscle constriction due to bronchospasm because of histamine and it also causes vasodilation so there will be increased 
increased vascular permeability for prostaglandin D2. Uh, there's bronchoconstriction. It also leads to vasodilation. PAF is going to cause aggregation of platelets and release of histamine. There will be further release of histamine because of PAF, and there will be eosinophil products. Of morphology, it's very difficult to see all these structures, but it is it is seen in those in those who have died because of prolonged severe attacks, as in cases of of asthmaticus. Grossly, lungs will be over distended because they will be over inflated. The, the, there will be entrapment of the air within, within the, the lungs. They will be over distended. If they, if, if, they, if they are over distended, they may even lead to atelectasis. The most striking finding is occlusion of the, of the bronchi and the bronchioles by this thick, tenacious mucus plug. This is how those mucus plugs may look like. You can see that they actually. Uh, they, they take the shape of the entire tree, entire respiratory tree or entire bronchial tree and they are so tenacious, so thick that they will be, they will be uh, occluding the lumen entirely. Uh, microscopically, you will see these mucus plugs may contain some holes of, uh, of shed epithelium because epithelium will be shed and they will be entrapped within these mucus plugs which are called as Kirschman spirals. You have charcoal written crystals which are basically the proteins of from which are secreted from the eosinophils and they, they take the shape of crystalloids. So these crystalloids which are made up of eosinophil proteins are called as charcoal written crystals. You will see numerous eosinophils, you will see a lot of neutrophils. If it is an atopic asthma only then you will see eosinophils. If it is non-atopic asthma you will only see neutrophils. Right? So if you see both neutrophils as well as eosinophils and you have a lot of eosinophils that definitely it is because of an allergic reaction, it is definitely because of type 1 hypersensitive reaction, it is definitely because of increased production of IgE, it is definitely, a, uh, it is definitely an atopic asthma. So we, we can see in this uh, diagram that there is a schematic representation of a normal of, of a normal bronchial wall you can see there's epithelium there is bronchial muscle you can see these um, uh, smooth muscle uh, sorry submucosal glands which are present here so when there is change there, there is uh, bronchial asthma there will be increased production of this mucus which is entirely covering uh, which is entirely occluding there there is hypertrophy of the bronchial smooth muscle there is a lot of inflammation all these green things these green dots are basically inflammation and edema. You can see these crystalloids which are charcoal laden crystals. You can see a few uh, Cushman spirals which will be entangled within this mucus and these will be the changes which will be seen in the wall of a bronchus. Here you can see this is the wall. You can see a small chunk of, uh, of cartilage so you know that this is a bronchial wall. You can see a lot of uh, a pink pink hyaline material which is present here this is basically mucus and all this the, these things can contain a lot of of neutrophils a lot of lymphocytes a lot of eosinophils if you if, if you zoom in you will see there are a lot of eosinophils in this all these cells which are having pinkish or orange pink granules within them are eosinophils uh, a slightly blown up image you can see there is vessel vasodilation there is congestion of the capillaries and all these cells which you can see here are are nothing but eosinophils all these are eosinophils along with that you can also see some chronic and acute inflammatory cells now you know these eosinophils are not only present inside the bronchial wall they will be also increased in your blood so if you do a, a differential count of wbc's you will see uh, you will find eosinophilia in the blood Chronic attacks, um, when it, it continues for long, uh, they are called as it's called as airway remodeling, which basically includes thickening of the wall because of thickening of the basement membrane and thickening of the bronchial epithelia. So they both will cause thickening of the airway wall. There will be uh, edema and an inflammatory infiltrate in the bronchial wall and if it is an atopic asthma you will see prominence of eosinophils and mast cells within this inflammatory infiltrate you will see there will be increase in the size of the submucosal glands and there will be some amount of goblet cell hyperplasia as well 
there will be hypertrophy of the bronchial muscle wall. These are the four very important features, thickening of the wall, edema and inflammation. Inflammation will be eosinophilic if it is atopic asthma, increase in the size of the submucosal glands, along with that there will be goblet cell hyperplasia, hypertrophy of the bronchial smooth muscle wall, hypertrophy as well as hyperplasia of the smooth muscles which are present inside this bronchus. All these features are collectively called as airway remodeling. This is how airway remodeling is. This is the normal structure. You have the epithelia, you have the basement membrane, you have the mucus, very thin layer of mucus. You have this lamina propria, you have a smooth muscle gland and then you have these submucosal glands which are present and this is the cartilage. Now in this case you can see there is goblet cell hyperplasia, goblet cell metaplasia. You can see a lot of inflammatory infiltrate in the wall which comprises of both eosinophils and neutrophils. You can see there is bronchial muscle hypertrophy. You can see there is hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the smooth muscle of the submucosal glands. You can see lymphocytes, you can see neutrophils, you can see eosinophils, you can see mast cells. So all this chronic acute and chronic inflammatory infiltrate will be present. There will be edema in the wall. There will be thickening of the basement membrane. There is thickening of the smooth muscle layer. So all these features collectively are called as airway remodeling. Here again, you can see some of these features of airway remodeling. You can see inflammatory infiltrate. You can see occlusion of the wall because of production of a lot of mucus thickening of the basement membrane you can see this are the smooth muscles which have hypertrophied and if it is because of allergy if it is an atopic asthma along with these neutrophils you will see a lot of eosinophils as well clinical features are definitely these these patients will have dyspnea which is associated with wheezing they will have difficulty in expiration like in all other like uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases, the attacks may will last for one to several hours and they subside either spontaneously or with therapy. You can give bronchodilators and corticosteroids. Bronchodilators are going to dilate the bronchioles for, uh, for obvious reasons and corticosteroids are going to uh, take care of all the chemical mediators which are being produced by arachidonic acid uh, metabolic pathway. There may be some intervals which are free from respiratory dif difficulty, but some 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 patients may have uh, a severe paroxysms that occur uh, that does not respond to therapy, and it may it may continue for long, for for even sometimes even for weeks. It's called as status asthmatic. The, the patients will have hypercapnia, they will have respiratory acidosis, and they will suffer from severe hypoxia. Now next topic is bronchiectasis. Now this bronchiectasis, as we have discussed earlier, is not actually a, a separate disease entity. This is actually an outcome or an end stage lung disease in which there is permanent dilation of bronchi and bronchioles due to destruction of the muscle and elastic supporting tissue. Any kind of obstruction, it can be in intrinsic or something which is from outside any kind of obstruction or any kind of infection is finally going to lead to bronchiectasis now the word bronchiectasia actually the suffix eactasia means dilatation and bronchus definitely is bronchi means bronchus and and, and uh, the smaller bronchioles so there is permanent dilation again the word permanent is quite important here there's permanent dilation of bronchi bronchioles due to destruction of the muscle and elastic supporting tissue. Cause is mainly chronic necrotizing infections. All these infections, streptococcus infections, staphylococcus, klebsiella, tuberculosis, which is one of the, the most common cause of bronchiectasis because of infection is tuberculosis. So obstructive causes they can be tumors which are which may be inside the lumen or they can be outside the lumen and just pressing upon the lumen foreign bodies impacted mucus because of chronic bronchitis or, or because of bronchial asthma this there will be impaction of mucus it can be post infective because of staphylococcus aureus klebsiella we have pseudomonas all these infections all these infectious agents can lead to necrotizing infections and which may 
finally lead to it can be congenital we have a few there are few diseases which are congenital diseases like cystic fibrosis you have cartagenous syndrome in in case of cystic fibrosis there is uh, something wrong with the pump which uh, sodium potassium pump and there is less amount of water which is being produced and when you have less amount of water in that mucus basically so there is less amount of water which is produced inside the mucus the mucus is very viscid the mucus is very thick and and that is going to cause a lot of complication because these mucus will be impacting the the airways so in this in, in, in cystic fibrosis the, the they are uh, they may have bronchitis cartagena syndrome is actually a, a rare autosomal recessive disorder that is which is actually associated with uh, bronchitis yes and also with sterility in males and they also uh, suffer from sinusitis and the problem in cartagena syndrome is there is some kind of uh, impairment of the cilia the cilia doesn't work properly so it will have an impaired mucociliary clearance and so, so so because of this uh, problem with the ciliary action there will be uh, the infections will persist and there will be reduced motility of of the things outside the lung so they they will they will stay inside the lung and will cause uh, infection and finally may lead to bronchitis it's a vicious cycle you have infection starts it or an obstruction starts it obstruction will finally lead to retention of the secretions they will lead to infection because it becomes a very uh, fertile ground for all the bacteria to grow on it it will lead to recurrent inflammations and these inflammations are finally going to wall this going to cause destruction of the tissue and again the destruction of the tissue is going to produce a lot of mucus there will be retention of secretion and this vicious 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 cycle will go on and of course it may also lead to because we do know that inflammations can lead to uh metaplasia or squamous metaplasia of the epithelium it mainly involves lower lobes bilaterally tumor or aspiration of foreign bodies it, if it is because of this these things which are actually localized to a single segment there will be bronchitis of only of that particular segment you will definitely see dilated airways and these airways are uh, 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 permanently dilated and damaged there will be acute and chronic inflammatory exudate within the walls of the bronchi and the bronchioles there will be ulceration of the epithelia there will be fibrosis of the bronchial and bronchial walls and and more importantly there is going to be a lot of peri bronchiolar fibrosis that means around the bronchi or around the bronchioles there will be a lot of fibrosis this is how it may look like you can see here all these are permanently dilated large airways now you may say that these they, they they sometimes may look like bullae but in the bullae or in the blebs of emphysema will you find this mucus no you won't find this mucus plus emphysema is not going to involve the large airways and i have i may be able to convince you without even touching this that these white things which are present around these larger airways this white this material or the whitish thing is basically the cartilage which is definitely uh, absent in cases of emphysema because it involves the respiratory bronchial again you can see all these are dilated hair spaces and they are really huge and plus you can see this mucus which is present inside these hair spaces these dilated bronchial or bronchial walls patients will have a severe persistent cough with of course mucopurulent sputum there is production of mucus there is infection so there is going to be a mucopurulent expectoration sputum may contains may contain some flecks of blood or it may even be a frank hemoptysis because these things may cause a lot of necrosis and may cause destruction of a large vessel and that vessel may bleed and the patient may die of frank hemoptysis the patient will have features of hypoxia in the form of hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy hypoxemia hypercapnia pulmonary hypertension and really these patients may or even have core pulmonary the infections may spread through blood and the patients may suffer from metastatic brain abscesses and may also have a secondary 
or a reactive amyloidosis which is associated with all uh, chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, so with this we end our discussion on obstructive pulmonary diseases. Thank you very much for listening.